Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I must tell you, it is a distinct honor to be here after 10 years of participating with Panhandle 2020. If you think back about the evolution of this group and what is ahead of us, it's an amazing journey. And we're here not only to celebrate that, to learn more about how we can participate in that effort. So I want to thank you for being here today, putting the time in that you do. We look around the room and see wonderfully the same faces, and it is great. So we're glad you're here today. From the city of Amarillo, I will tell you, you are the glue that binds us together when we start to fall apart a little bit. You do the things that help revive and initiate things in our community. We cannot do without the efforts that you give to our community. And I want to now introduce and thank Julie Oliveras for being here, and she will carry on the program. Thank you again for being here today. I don't think we can say thank you enough, so I'm going to echo thank you all for your commitment to the community by being here. And when I say community, just right up front, I want to say we're talking about the entire panhandle when we talk about community. So it is the collective communities that make up the panhandle. We appreciate very much the sponsors that made this day happen and have helped Panhandle 2020 along the way. They are listed on the back of your agenda, but I would like to read our event sponsors, the Amarillo Area Foundation, Amarillo College, Excel Energy, Baptist Community Services, and Amarillo ISD. Our table sponsors are Underwood Law Firm, Amarillo National Bank, Atmos Energy, Cal Farley's, Mary E. Bivens Foundation, Education Credit Union, PRPC, WTAMU, and WTAMU Enterprise Center. Uh, so a round of applause for those sponsors, please. You're going to hear the term community a lot today, and when we talk about community, it's all of us. The um, board of Panhandle 2020 is also listed in your packet, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank our director, Annette Carlisle, for what she's done. She calls herself the community nag sometimes, but we have better and more affectionate terms for her. The, work, the group that works so hard on today's um, event is the 10th anniversary committee. Trina Ryder, Lulu Cowan, Pat Cathcart, Alice O'Brien, Belinda Palacios, Russell Lowry Hart, David Hudson, Denise Skinner, Charlotte Rhodes, Vicki Nelson, Elia Moreno, and Wes Reeves. Thank you all very much for having us here today. We are working on a very tight time schedule today, so please move with us. We're going to move locations partway through our day, um, but we commit to ending on time, so that will be an incentive to when we're pushing you down the hallway, you'll know that that's what we're trying to do. So as we begin today, I want you to think about 10 years ago in your own life. You can think about improvement, things that have been great things in your life, setbacks, things that 10 years ago you were going to work on and hadn't quite gotten to it or hadn't quite gotten to the level that you wanted to be. I had a two-year-old and a middle schooler 10 years ago. We can often watch those years through kids and other people that show significant change in how they physically appear. But we must know that looking back is important, but moving forward every day, step, one step in front of the other, is the most important thing. So on this stage 10 years ago, Dr. James Hallmark said, today is about destiny. It still is, and I agree, but I encourage us to think of destiny in new ways. William Jennings Bryan said, destiny is not a matter of chance, but a matter of choice. It is not a thing to be waited for, it is a thing to be achieved. This work, regardless of what this work means, whether it's education, poverty, or another area, it changes the course of lives for the better. It is work, though, and work is hard. Um, it's filled with joy and with pain sometimes. At our house, we often remind each other, most things are hard before they are easy. We must take a balanced view between the past, present, and future. You know, there's distinction between historical and historic. Every event that takes place is historical. But every event, not every event, is historic. Historic events change the course of history and become the cause for future celebration, mourning, or memorial. What will our historic moments be? 
we should take somewhat of a Kaizen approach. Small, consistent improvement equals massive improvement over time. The beauty with this approach is that it forces you to look at right now, what do we need in our community? Looking forward, we have to answer what do we want for our community, and we're going to have a lot of ammunition to look at that today. There's power in community for people with hope, for education, for business, for a better quality of life. You have made the difference with Panhandle 2020 for 10 years, and you are the key to future destiny. We're going to watch a video that's going to help you grab onto a little bit of the background for the last 10 years, and hopefully instill a sense of urgency in you to continue to work together to create change. And now we're going to see if I can play this video. No, it's, it's, it's not a touch screen for that. Oh, just a touch screen. I'm reminded of an old country song, one of a particularly great country song, but everything reminds me of a country song. We got a long ways to go and a short time to get there. But it could be done. What I like about Panhandle is its independent spirit. I think in our country, we have too many people who want to look to someone else to solve their problems. But I see in Panhandle people the idea that we solve our own problems. And quite frankly, Panhandle 2020 is proof of, of that spirit. I grew up near the Canadian River. Used to spend a lot of time climbing those little hills, which to me were big. We've got great imagery here. We've got the Cadillac Ranch, Paladura Canyon, downtown Amarillo that's growing. But we also have some challenges. The winds of change blow through everywhere. You can't, you can't find a part of the Texas Panhandle or of Texas that aren't being impacted by everything around them. 2020 has probably, as an organization, impacted probably more different areas and individuals than any other program that I can think of that I've been involved with and that would be since the 1970s in Amarillo. I think we as people have changed and we see there's a need and we get up and help with that need, knowing that once that person is up and running, they will do the same. The most profound impact that 2020 has had on our community is really because of the foundation it provided in our community and understanding who we are and the role that education plays in that. We were able to be identified in a national stage through the Bill and Melinda Gates Partners for Post-Secondary Success Grant. Without 2020, the PPS grant never would have happened and we wouldn't have any of the No Limits, No Excuses programs, the Neighborhood program, the Opportunity Conferences. Panhandle 2020 has done a wonderful job of allowing this community to acknowledge some realities, in some cases some very difficult realities that really need our attention. We have big disconnects in our community between socioeconomic groups. You know, it's not necessarily pleasant or something you want to put on a, a billboard outside of town, low educational attainment levels in the community ahead. Poverty is a really difficult subject for a lot of people to get their arms around, and they think there are a lot of people in our community and in everywhere that just wants to take advantage of the system. But the truth of the matter is, without the system that provides the support that they need, people can't get out of poverty. I think one of the things we have to do is be able to put aside a lot of our differences and come together. We will see a better Amarillo, a stronger Amarillo, and an Amarillo that thrives and it will also draw other industries and companies to come in to want to be a part of this community as they see the educational level go up. The changes that we've already experienced may be less than the changes we're going to experience in the next 20 years. You can look after your own self-interest by dealing with these issues because it will impact you personally in a positive way. We need to be prepared to have a frank dialogue about what it's going to take us to overcome those challenges that are identified.
I believe it is essential for Panhandle 2020 to continue to bring the community together, the disparate views, ideas, perspectives, and address these challenges as, as one united entity. We have seen some really stark changes on how we address the issues of poverty, educational attainment, uh, work sustainability, etc. And, uh, you know, we're not done yet by no means, but we have actually uh, laid the groundwork for moving forward. Planning for the future is really important for any community. I think uh, out of all the communities that I deal with, throughout the nation and in Texas, the Panhandle is very unique and we have a culture of working together, uh, but we still have issues. As a community and as a Panhandle, we've experienced a really devastating drought, but I think that drought was also representative of where we were as a community. We had a drought of, of energy, of ideas, of partnerships, of vision, of um, ambition and 2020 and the use of data and the facilitation of conversation and the building of relationships across neighborhoods across industries across educational purposes has really created a whole new environment that I think we're moving towards if we do not combine our resources and let the whole be greater than the sum of our parts we can beat to 2040. If we can do all that, I don't think there's a city that I know of that has a better chance to meet those challenges than ever in Texas. We really wanted to hear Bud again. I am trying to get the lights on. Ten years ago, we started in the dark. Maybe this is. <laughs> Ten years ago, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know where we were going, but we knew we needed to do something. And I just have to give kudos to our middle, my middle son for uh, that video, the work on that. And I really thank the folks who interviewed for it. Uh, it was nice to, to hear the great comments and, and to pull those out and to really build something for our community uh, for our 10 year anniversary event. But 10 years ago, we didn't know where we were going. And I'm so glad we started the journey. And if you were in this room 10 years ago, would you raise your hand? Steve, you were, you gotta raise your hand. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. So 10 years ago, a lot of folks were here. I have to thank uh, a lot of people in this room. I couldn't begin to thank the folks who 2020 would not exist had it not been for their continued effort. But I do wanna thank our board president, Julian Taveras, our board vice president, David Hudson, our um, our, just our, our great community of support, our, our, our board, the Amarillo Area Foundation, and also uh, past board presidents, Dr. Russell Lowry Hart, uh, Dr. James Hallmark came for it. Thank you for being here, James. Uh, and, and so we really appreciate uh, everything that everyone's been involved in. Thanks. 
I also want to talk about partnership. I want to thank our partners because partners are who make this happen. Uh, our mission is to be a catalyst for positive change in the Texas Panhandle. And uh, that's kind of just a big nebulous uh, you know, thing. And what does that mean? It really means for us pulling together different individuals, different organizations, and changing behaviors in those. And boy, have we got some great partners. Uh, if you don't know about our work, you can read some more about it. You'll probably hear a little bit about it uh, throughout the discussions at lunch. But uh, if the partners didn't step up and really put time, energy, lots of time at committee meetings, uh, and lots and their resources into really pulling this together, nothing would have changed for the better. But I am proud of the things that we have accomplished. But our role is to connect, equip, and inform. So to connect you, you're here today. To equip you, you have this. This is for you to keep take home, stick it in your file folder, and uh, I'm gonna walk through it. We've got the agenda. We've got our partners who supported us. We've got our advisory board and our founding board, uh, founding members. And on this sheet, this is a sheet for you to keep and take notes on and, and to add to as time goes on, but use this throughout your discussion. And then you also have an invitation to something that you know, is connected to this, a shake it up event uh, in there. You also have the biography of our speaker. So let me introduce you now to Dr. Murdoch. Steve Murdoch came 10 years ago and we brought him in to really open the, uh, the community's eyes because as much as we talked and as much as we repeated his numbers, we had people tell us we were flat out making those numbers up. We're not. Unfortunately, we're not. Uh, some of the numbers are not what we want. And that's why we're here, because as we, as we change as a community, we've got to work together better, smarter, um, and we've got to make the solutions work here. Because I don't think the solutions are coming from somewhere else. And if they are, great. But I really think they're in our neighborhoods, they're in our institutions, they're in our relationships one-on-one -on -one with each other. So Dr. Murdoch came here, opened our eyes, um, to things that we really had kind of ignored as the community and some big issues that we took on. And working on these things take time. They take commitment. The commitment, like I've mentioned, of our partners. They may not be sexy things to work on. They're not quick fixes. But the more we can work together on these big issues, the better we are both as a community, as a region, and as a state. Dr. Murdoch is known statewide and beyond for using information to tell a story in a, in a, in a, in a fun way. And uh, he's a numbers guy, but I love how he tells a story with numbers and he's great at it. You know, we could, we could have shown these numbers somewhere, you know, from some other information, but we went to the source and the, to the guy who kicked us off. We are so honored to have him. He's a Rice professor now uh, at the Rice University. Prior to that, he ran our Census Bureau. Prior to that, he was our first state demographer. And uh, so he's known statewide and nationwide as an expert in demographic changes and what numbers mean. And uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Murdoch to uh, take us th through the next 10 years and beyond. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and have a chance to speak to all of you again. I'm going to come down here. I'm a college professor, by the way, you know, and one of the things you learn is that if you get close enough to your students, they won't fall asleep right in front of you. So I'm going to do that. And, and I do appreciate the very nice write-up and everything that you've given me. And it uh, uh, does remind me, however, of an introduction I got once, which was a little bit unusual. I was in a small East Texas town. And, and the gentleman who, civic organization, gentleman who was given the job of introducing me had gotten ill at the very last moment. And this other gentleman who was on the, one of the officers got handed this, this uh, description. And I looked out of the corner of my eye and I saw one of the things that was happening to him was he was looking at this word demographer. 
But time came, he had to introduce me. So he got up and he said, you know, Dr. Murdoch's done a lot of things. He's done a lot of rural things and he's done a lot of dim, dim, I guess he's best, finally he said, I guess he's just best seen as a rural demagoguer. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to be a demagoguer today. I'm going to try to talk about the future and the past, talk about where we are, and we're going to talk about not only where you are in the panhandle, but where we are in Texas and where we are in the country. Because increasingly, they look the same. They look similar in terms of the issues and so forth. So I want to point out a little bit about our data. I'm going to leave these slides and uh, when I first sent them to Annette I think she uh, began to have a heart attack because I sent her 350 slides. <laughs> I'm only going to go through 325 this morning. No, no. Uh, I'm going to go through a lot of slides but I'm leaving them there as a database that you can use uh, as, you, as you see fit. Well, let's start off with this is a chart I like to say this is a chart that shows that in every period of time since Texas first allowed the US to join it we have grown more rapidly than the country as a whole uh, but that growth has been particularly large as you can see in the last several decades the 80s the 90s the 2000 the 2010 period all about rapid population growth Texas had the, by far the largest increase almost 4.3 million in that last census decade uh, even larger than California, which you see is about 12 million larger than we are in terms of total size in 2010. Uh, if you look at the most recent uh, data, and just kind of look at the left-hand side of it, Texas is the fastest growing uh, in numerical terms. Uh, and if you look at, hmm, something's gone, okay. Look at it in percentage terms, we are the second fastest growing. <clears throat> now, the re there's one good reason why I bring up this slide. I am a native of the great state of North Dakota. <laughs> and I've been doing this for about 40 years and I never in my life thought I would live long enough to see North Dakota as the fastest growing state in the country. <laughs> now you will notice, however, that North Dakota had to grow about 24,000 to get that compared to 800,000, but who's counting, okay? <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about where you are. Panhandle kind of sits in the middle of things from size and from growth rates and lots of factors. Uh, in many ways, what I always tell people is you have to understand where you're located. And if you look at where you're located, you're doing very well for, in comparison to other parts of the Great Plains. If you take the parts of the Great Plains that don't have energy development right now, uh, they're having much slower growth than you're having. So you're doing very well, uh, certainly in terms of overall growth in a relative sense. Uh, Amarillo, uh, similarly, when you look at it in terms of, of where it is on that chart, you can go on down and see it's about 10 or 11 from the, from the bottom, but that means of our 25, it's about in the middle. You've still got a growth of about 10%, which is good for Plains area. It's good for uh, the uh, Panhandle uh, as a whole. This is where you were in the most recent data, which is from 2010 to 2012. Again, you're kind of in the middle. You had a 2.2% rate of growth. Uh, yes, you're not growing at the level that they're growing in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth or Houston. Uh, and in fact, one of the things I always get a kick out of, frankly, is that when I go to Houston, where I live now, and I talk about things, they'll say, you know, we're not at all like Dallas. <laughs> and when I go to Dallas, they say, you know, we're not at all like Houston. And you notice they're right on that chart because on a base of six million people, they had a 21,000 difference in their overall growth. Obviously not at all alike, okay? But certainly they're still the two big bears, if you will, in the area. This shows simply from 2000 to 2010, uh, the areas that were growing and declining, the red ones are declining. Uh, and one of the interesting things for Texas and for the country is this. Despite in Texas we've got the rap most rapid growth in the country as a state, if you look at the number here that are declining, about 79, this is 2000 to 2010, if you notice from 2010 to 12, we actually have 96 declining now. So we have more declining counties in Texas now than we had last decade, okay? Uh, and that is a function of a lot of different things, but it's a function also of concentration of growth in more areas and some rural counties in particular 
uh, across Texas. And most of the growth is in what we sometimes call the Texas Triangle, that area from Dallas down to San Antonio and I mean down to Austin, San Antonio and on over to Houston and the, the uh, Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and your area is intermediate in growth. The growth in numbers, I argue, is not the most important factor impacting Texas or the nation. I argue it is change, and particularly change in the racial and ethnic composition of our country and our state. And I'm going to show you a lot of charts that are very similar, so I want to take just a minute to point these, what I want you to really look at. They're all going to look like this. But what I want you to look at is to look at the percent change. So you see in Texas from 2000 to 2010, non-Hispanic whites grew by 4.2%. And this part in particular, which points out the percent of all change that was due to each racial and ethnic group. So you see that 10.8, about 11% of growth in Texas from 2000 to 2010 was due to non-Hispanic whites. 65% was due to Hispanics, 12% to African Americans, put Asians and others together, about another 12% of the growth. Now, one of the interesting things in Texas is that if you look at the population of voting age, 18 and over, if you look at the percent that is not Hispanic white, it's 50% basically, and about a third of that population is Hispanic. And then you can see about 11% is African American, and another 5% or so uh, is Asian and other. But notice if we look at the population under 18, you basically reverse those two. That is, a third of the population under 18 is not Hispanic white. Half is Hispanic. So about the opposite of what you had when you had the, the 18 plus population. Well, you know, let's look at this in a little more detail. And I want to do something very simple here. I want you to look at these maps and they're color coded. And so if a group is growing, it's going to be, the county's going to be in blue. If a group is declining, it's going to be in red. So we'll start off here talking about non-Hispanic whites or what we in Texas call Anglos. Now, I get repeated nasty, nasty, nasty emails saying, tell Murdoch not to use Anglos. It's an inappropriate, it's an incorrect use of the term, but I find that lots of Texans still think Anglos is the term, so I use it variously. You can see that the concentration of non-Hispanic whites is very much in terms of growth has been one area in, in your uh, region, uh, and mostly in the Panhandle, and in various uh, spots around Texas. Now, if we talk about the Hispanic population, remember blue is growth, red is decline, okay? If we go back, how many counties did we have declining? 102 counties in, not, uh, wait a minute, it go the wrong way. If you take uh, 161 declining in terms of their non-Hispanic white population, 91 in growing, okay? If you look at the Hispanic population, now those pink ones are ones that have too few a number to actually generally talk about change, but look at there were 228 growing in, their, in Hispanic populations, 28 declining. Now, this is the African American population. Interestingly, most of the growth uh, being in that panhandle, in that, in that triangle part of Texas, and some of the decline in the old southern parts of Texas. That's true across the country. Parts of what were the old south, for example, uh, like in East Texas and across, are showing decline in African American populations. Uh, and if we look then at the Asian population, what do we see? Well, interesting combination. Growth primarily in the triangle, but a couple other things that are going on. Notice the other areas of growth tend to be areas with one of two characteristics. Either they have a large university or they have large medical centers. And in all those cases, if you kind of go around and look at them, you'll find out, uh, with some exceptions where there's small numbers, that's the case. Well, Texas has a lot of growth, a lot of diversification. Duh, that's a big surprise, right? Well. You know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is if you start looking at the United States. Now, remember what proportion of the growth in Texas was due to non-Hispanic whites? 10.8%, 11%. If you go to the same part of the chart up here, what part of the United States growth was due to non-Hispanic whites? Eight, 
percent. Eight percent. And if you look at children, look at the change you see here. This is, this is really a powerful set of numbers. In other words, we had a net decline of 4.3 million non-Hispanic white children in the United States from 2000 to 2010. Now, that doesn't mean they died. It meant that they got older, etc. But it was offset by a set, an increase of about 4.8 million Hispanic kids. In fact, had it not been for the growth in the number of Hispanic kids, we would have had one of the largest declines in the child population in the United States in U.S. history. So we're changing very rapidly. Well, <clears throat> let's look at maps again. This is the non-Hispanic white or Anglo population. Uh, blue is growth, red is decline. You can see lots of areas in Texas where there's a decline, lots of areas across the country. Overall, we have about 3,200 counties, about 1,700 have declined, about 1,500 have had uh, growth in non-Hispanic white populations. This is, on the other hand, the under eight, this, I'm sorry, this, on the other hand, is the Hispanic population. Again, remember that blue is growth, red is decline. If you're one of those people that think Hispanic population growth is a California, Arizona, Texas, Florida, New York, and a few other places, you are absolutely wrong. I do this kind of work in various parts of the country, and I have yet to find areas where there is an extensive Hispanic population growth in that last decade. Now, you can see some places up in the Great Plains where there's too <clears throat> few to count, but you continue to see that kind of pattern. This is, the, this is the African American population. Notice that red across the Old South, but about two growing for each one declining in terms of counties. And if you take non-Hispanic uh, Asians, Asian population, uh, growth in about 16 to declining in each one. So it's 16 to one growth to decline. Well, now let's look at this very quickly for our major MSAs in your area. Notice, this is the Austin, this is the most, well, there's no other to say to wait, this is the whitest part of Texas. Okay, in, many, in terms of major metropolitan areas. But still, if you look at percent of total change that was due, 39% of the change was due to non-Hispanic whites, 45% to Hispanics. If we look at uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we see 13% growth due to non-Hispanic whites, 52%. And remember, this is not the cities of Dallas. This is not the cities of Austin. This is the metropolitan area. This includes the suburbs of these areas. And if we look at children, what do we see here? Dallas, Fort Worth, a net decline in the number of non-Hispanic white children. This is Houston, 7% of the growth due to non-Hispanic whites. This is the MSA again. So this includes the Woodlands. This includes Katy, etc. Uh, and if you look at children, again, a decline of 48,000. This is San Antonio, 18% of the growth due to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting things overall, if I looked at it, would be to say, which I won't have time today, but one of the things I like to ask audiences, which of our major cities, three major cities, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, has the largest percent of its children who are Anglo? It's San Antonio, Texas. Dallas, it's 14.5%. Houston, it's 14.6%. San Antonio, it's the city now, not the MSA, is 16.9%. So the growth and change is very, very clear. This is San Antonio. We saw a net decline in terms of uh, uh, Anglo kids. Well, let's talk about your region. Look what you see up there. What's it show for non-Hispanic whites? This is the total population. This is not children. You lost about 18,000 non-Hispanic whites during that period of time. Not unusual for parts of the Great Plains. And you see that the growth that occurred, the 25,000, was basically all of it was a function, or nearly all of it was a function of growth in Asian, um, African American, and, and uh, Hispanic populations. This is the under 18. 9,000 declined the number of non-Hispanic white children, offset in great part by almost 12,000 Hispanic children. This is the Alamo area, this is the Alamo metropolitan area, decline of about 2,000 non-Hispanic whites, 20,000 increase in Hispanics. Uh, this is the under 18, loss of about 4,000 uh, uh, non-Hispanic white children, increases in all other 
uh, racial and ethnic groups, particularly Hispanics. This is a city of, Santa, city of Amarillo. Decline. Number of Hispanic, non-Hispanic whites uh, increase, particularly in Hispanics. This is the under 18, same kind of pattern. And I'll take just the two major counties. Loss for the total pop in the number of non-Hispanic whites. Loss in the number of children. Randall had a gain in the number of non-Hispanic whites. Only exception up here, but still had a loss in terms of the number of, of, Hispanic, of non-Hispanic uh, white children. These patterns are pervasive, and your pattern is like other parts of the Great Plains because of an age structure issue. You have an older population, if you will, uh, particularly of the Anglo population. Well, I mean, who cares about these dull old demographics? I mean, who cares how old people are or what their other characteristics are? Why should we care about other characteristics? Well, I argue we should care about these characteristics socioeconomic characteristics is because due to a variety of historical discriminatory and other factors these demographic characteristics these socioeconomic characteristics are tied to our demographic characteristics and as we change our population if we do not change the socioeconomic characteristics that go with demographic groups we will as we change our population change the very socioeconomic structure of Texas of the panhandle and I'd argue of the United States of America let's look at some of these factors for a minute and we're going to do this very quickly and we're going to concentrate on just a couple of factors. Let's look up here at poverty rates for African Americans and Hispanics. Just concentrate and compare them to those for non-Hispanic whites. And you notice this is for the United States as a whole and you see that these are about three times as large as here. In 1999 you'll see that they're about three, two and a half to three times larger here. You'll notice something else. These are in constant dollars, 2010 dollars. The average American in 2010 was in fact poorer than the average American in 1999. Every place you see the same basic kind of pattern. Not every absolute place, but in general uh, you'll see those kind of patterns. Oh, but let's look just at the poverty for just a few minutes. And so, if we look at this, it's about three, as I said, to one. If we look for Texas, about the same, about three to one, okay? If we look at Austin MSA, two, two and a half to one, kind of three to one again. If we look at Dallas, Fort Worth, about three to one, sometimes almost four to one. Houston, about almost three to three and a half uh, to one, if you look at the poverty rate. San Antonio, uh, actually about two to two and a half. In fact, one of the interesting things about San Antonio is that if you looked at the cities, guess which one of our major cities, including Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, etc., has the lowest poverty rate for Hispanics. It's San Antonio, Texas. Because these are multi-generational populations that are proceeding forward socioeconomically like lots of other populations have uh, as they went through that immigrant uh, experience because a lot, of a lot of people, a lot of Hispanics in San Antonio, you know, have been there longer than the Anglos. You know, and in fact, I remember coming as a new person not knowing Texas and I was driving in San Antonio the first time and I was on I-10 and I saw my first, the first exit I saw was Fredericksburg. And I said, oh, good, good German town. Then I got real confused because the next exit was De Zavala. Okay? And it shows that heritage that goes back to the very beginning of, of that area. Well, here's Panhandle. And a couple things that are interesting here is you can see that it's like three and a half to one in, in 2000. About the same kind of thing in 2010. You have large rates, high rates in some areas, uh, as you see, for African Americans are larger than Hispanics. That's been not true in most other places that we've looked at. This is the Amarillo area. Again, uh, poverty rates are higher for African Americans, but in all cases, they're two to three to, or more times higher than they are for non-Hispanic whites. This is Potter County, a similar kind of pattern, at least two, sometimes almost three times as high. Uh, and this is Randall County, a little less, but still a couple times as high, lower rates of poverty for African Americans and Hispanics, uh, particularly in 2010. Okay. 
Now we're going to do another round robin, and this time I want to concentrate on education. We'll take just one factor to look at. I don't want to pick on any group, but we'll pick in this sense. Look at Hispanics with less than a high school level of education. What do we find in the United States of America? 38%. What do we find in Texas? 40%. And now I'm going to switch something. I'm going to start showing Hispanics as a third group, okay? Uh, in Austin, Texas, 39%. In the city of Dallas, 56% of Hispanics have less than high school level of education. And people in my city like to say, well, you know, we're not anything like Dallas. <laughs> They're right, we're only 51%. <laughs> okay? And here's San Antonio. See the high school level of education? Less in that group because there's more in other groups. Again, you see that success that comes over time. Uh, this is your area. If we look at Hispanics, right at the state average for uh, the MSA as a whole, for the city of Amarillo, 42.5%, etc. Now, how have you guys been doing economically? And again, I'm going to do something that will just take a few slides, okay? But I want to concentrate because I think you need to know you're doing well in lots of ways, but I want to concentrate just at this bottom line here. That's the growth really from 2000 to 2010 in total employment in America as a whole, 7.2%. So, you know, I'm going to let, and that's got to remember the 7.2%, okay? And then if we look at Texas overall, we see 22.5%. And so I'm going to make you remember 22%. Okay. Now let's look at other MSAs and let's look at your area. Uh, this is Austin, 30%. Much better than the country, uh, better than the state as a whole. This is Dallas, hmm, better than the, than the country as a whole, but kind of below the par, if you will, for uh, the, the, and this is the, again, MSA uh, for, the, for Texas. This is Houston above both, 29% uh, versus the seven and the, and the 22. This is San Antonio, greater than 30%. Here's your panhandle area, 10%. Better than the country, not as good as the state, but again, we gotta take into account context and you have some very good levels of growth overall. What you don't have, which you do have in some parts of Texas, is some of those values over there in that right-hand column have negative signs in front of them. You don't really have that for the region. You see a better uh, rate of growth, if you will, uh, for uh, the Amarillo area, 14%. Uh, some good growth uh, in a variety of areas, uh, uh, including business management. So your growth is good. Yes, it's not like some of the bigger uh, centers that are optimally placed for a lot of reasons. What about the future? Well, this is the United States as a whole, and that figure over there is in thousands. So we're talking about a population from 2000 to 2060, from our last census to 2060, 50 years, of 420 million people. This is the United States as a whole. And this is the amount of growth in numbers that we expect to have. 111.5 million people will be added. And notice how many we're going to add that are non-Hispanic white. A negative 18 million, okay? And by far the largest increase is gonna be 78.3 million that will be Hispanic. The person who did this particular chart for me, she brought this in and she said, here's the chart, and I said, you can't have that chart. I said, that's a pie chart. And, every, you know, what do you got on there? He said, well, how do you do a pie chart that shows the amount of growth? I've got to show the non-Hispanic white, but their growth added to the total is zero because it's negative, right? It's actually negative. So, but you see that 61% of the growth is expected to be due to Hispanics. All of the growth to minority populations. What we see here, Let's just kind of look at this a little bit. 
you know, th this is what the elderly will be. <clears throat> Some of us will be in that category. I, I'm uh, just not going to do it. I've decided <laughs> I'm just not going to be in that category. Well, actually, I don't want to get into it. Uh, but you know, that's about 13. This is about 21. We're going to see that level of 22. We're going to have that level of growth across the country. We're an aging population. Uh, but when you look at that, I want you to look at just one part of this chart. This is in 2010. And notice that in every age group, every single age group, non-Hispanic whites are a majority, 50% or more. Now we go to 2060. And in only one age group, 65 plus, are non-Hispanic whites a majority. Every other age group, they're less than 50%. Now, what about Texas? Well, these are charts done by the Texas, uh, projections done by the Texas State Data Center. We assisted in them in this process this time. We expect Texas to have lots of growth, increase to 55 million people. Uh, as you can see, we expect there still to be at least under the highest growth scenario. Uh, we would continue to have uh, some growth in non-Hispanic white populations. If either of the two other scenarios were to occur, that would not be the case. But let's look and see a little more about this. Under this scenario that, under each of the scenarios, in fact, one of the things to notice is the percent that will be Hispanic of the total population by 2050 is over 50% under any of those scenarios. And this is one that bases it only on births, no migration whatsoever. And the notice at the same time, non Hispanic white goes from 45 to 33, or 27, or down to 22. The, Hispanic, the African American population drops by about 1 or 2%. But we're seeing dramatic kinds of change. And overall, if you take the one that most of us think is the most likely, that's this particular scenario, only 2% of the net growth will be due to non-Hispanic whites, 71% due to Hispanics, and 8% to uh, non-Hispanic or uh, African Americans. Uh, this is a chart I want you to show you just about what you won't be surprised about. By 2050, if you look at, this is the proportion of this population that is in each of these age groups. And so by 2050, what you'd see that 28% basically of Anglos or non-Hispanic whites would be uh, 65 years of age or older, compared to only about 13% of Hispanics. But if we change the numbers and look at it going crossways, of those that will be 65 years of age or older, the largest single group of elderly people will be Hispanic in Texas. So we're seeing dramatic changes uh, as we look to the future. Now, one of the things I get asked, particularly by students, when they look at me and my gray hair, which, by the way, I use gray in to look older. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I see that there's many people, uh, you've used a little too much, of something. never mind, uh, you know, uh, but, but, you know, we've all done that to try to look more distinguished. Right, sir? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Is my students in college say, well, how pervasive will you old people be? <laughs> and I want to say, as pervasive as we can be, but they don't like that answer. But here I just want to share, this is 2010, and the, you know, you've heard people talk about that infamous one in five Americans will be 65 years of age or older. Ever heard that? Oh, they used to just, you know, you heard that everywhere you go. So I said, okay, the blue up there is this, are the counties that in 2000 already were 20% or more of the population was, 20, was 65 years of age or older. So blue is 20% or more. This is 2010. This is 2050. There's only one thing to deduce from this chart. You have one place that you can live here and get away from we elderly. Or you can live in College Station. <laughs> See, even youths have their penalties. No. <laughs> I was at A&M for 20 some years, so I can't. <laughs> Got to be able to rib them a little bit. But you see how pervasive the aging of the population is. Now, this is the panhandle. 
this is the Panhandle Regional Council of Government area. Uh, and you can see if, if things go as the, they did the last 10 years, you could grow almost 300,000 people over the next 40 years. That growth would be overwhelmingly from the minority populations because, in fact, uh, under uh, any of the three scenarios, the number of non-Hispanic whites declines. So if you look at this one, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, you'll see declines in the number of non-Hispanic whites, and you'll see substantial increases in the Hispanic population. Now, this means that you'll have between 45 and 58 percent of the population that will be Hispanic. My uh, angles will go from 47 down to about 29 percent. Uh, net growth, if you look at the change where you, the sum, the pluses and the minuses, what you see is you lose, under this scenario, almost a half million non-Hispanic whites, offset by about 295,000 Hispanics. And you'd have about 25 percent of those non-Hispanic whites that would be 65 years of age or older. This is Amarillo. Uh, same kind of general patterns of growth with uh, virtually all of the change taking place, well, all of the change taking place as a result of non-Hispanic, uh, uh, of, of uh, populations other than non-Hispanic whites. This is the percentages, and you can see what happens to the Anglo percentage and to the Hispanic percentage as you go down these charts and as you go up and you see it there. And net change again that would all be as a result of minority populations. Uh, this is age groups, same kind of pattern, but with a little older, about 27 percent of all the people being, of non-Hispanic whites being 65 years of age or older. This is Potter County, and I do, by the way, have projections for all of the counties, but I'm not going to go through all of them today. And, and I know that that's disappointing some of you uh, because you were wanting to be here for three and a half hours. Anyway. If we look at this, we can see in Potter, uh, good economic, good general growth overall, about 60,000 people, okay? Uh, and what you'll see is that a lot of that growth will be tied to Hispanic populations. Uh, and so you end up with 50% Hispanic under any scenario, down to under 18% Anglo under the fastest growth scenario, and decline for, for its uh, non-Hispanic whites in every category, and again, a relatively older Anglo population. This is Randall County. Now, one of the things you're going to see here is that Randall County grows more than Potter County under this scenario, but a lot of it has to do with what happens to the Hispanic population. And these levels of growth, which I know are how they're computed, may be correct, but they are compounding here that may make that a little less. In other words, it may be that the sec second scenario uh, is more likely. I can't say that for sure. You might continue to have in Randall County the kind of Hispanic population growth, but you're dealing here with uh, percentages on very small basis uh, uh, that led, uh, led you here. But as you can see, why I'm saying that is under this scenario, you're 54 percent uh, Hispanic under these, you're substantially less Hispanic. So a lot of it depends on what happens if you continue that Hispanic population growth that you had in the last decade. Well, we know the demographics, we know the socioeconomics. What can change the socioeconomics for the country, for your region, for Texas? Education. Now, you're probably sitting there saying, well, you know, this is a college professor. What would we expect him to say will change the world? Because I've been a college professor all of my life. But the reason I say this is because every single study shows that the single best predictor of socioeconomic success is education. Now, that does not mean there aren't eighth grade graduates that are multi-billionaires. Doesn't mean that at all. But it means on average, as you begin to look at change, you have to look at factors that make critical differences. And education is one of those. Here's a chart, it's a national chart, based on 2011, looking when the recession was even worse than it is now. 
Uh, and on the left-hand side, you show unemployment rates. The average unemployment rate was 7.6%. It's been higher than that. It's, you know, in, getting close back to there. But you see that anyone with an associate degree or above had a lower level of unemployment. On the right-hand side, if you look at income, you can see the difference between that less than high school. This is weekly incomes from $451 to $1,500. Those are big and real differences. Education does pay. Now, this is a very complex chart. And Annette has promised me that at the end of our presentation, she will recite the whole chart <laughs> to anyone who wants her to, but there might not be many takers. But here are the things to look at are this. And that is, notice, as you go from less to more, okay, you might say, well, manager and professional, I understand that. But notice, even for operatives and laborers, the difference here for non-Hispanic whites is 48 to 89. And what you'll find is that improvement in income with education is true for all racial and ethnic groups, and one little kind of exception within all occupational groups. Now, you might also say, but wait a minute. Hispanics and African Americans don't make, for example, at that managerial professional, the same amount as non-Hispanic whites. That's true. That, that could be due to a discriminatory issues. It can be due as well to the fact that when you get to groups like non-Hispanic whites, they're more likely to be a first, not a first generation, but a second or third or fourth generation, for example, of professional. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you were such that mom and dad could leave you a little bit of money, your total income will often be greater uh, than it was if you were the first generation. And particularly non-Hispanic African Americans and non-Hispanic and Hispanics are likely to be uh, first generations. But still, education pays for everybody. Now, this is Texas. We've had lots and lots and lots of growth in education. 50% increase over the last two decades. You can see college and university went up almost 47% uh, in the last period of time. Uh, you can see when you look at colleges and universities that we have diversified those populations. But unfortunately, if you look at college age populations, even though we've diversified them, we do not have, if you had it simply on numbers of kids, the numbers we should have in the African American category and in the Hispanic category. They're below the percentages we should have on just a population base. But what have we done in public education? We had this crisis, and what we've done is run to pour money into it, right? Well, not really. Because if you look at it per student, that last column over here, okay, so that is, if you will, uh, the per student increases. If you took elementary and secondary over a decade now, over a decade, and I think there was more inflation than 3% in the 2000-2010, at least I'm guessing. What did we do in elementary and secondary? We added 3%. This is Texas. And what did we do to public colleges and universities? On a per student basis, we were funding them 28% less in 2010 than we were in 2000. By the way, that's a national average of what we did with higher education in the United States. Now, we won't talk about all those implications. One of those implications that scares me to death is the, of, is the rate of indebtedness I see in college students. It is amazing, and if you work in a college, uh, you'll begin to see them. Uh, now, where are we going? How much growth are we going to expect? Well, look at this. This is total, this is colleges and universities. We're going to add a simple about 5.6 million kids to our system over the next 40 years. Uh, realize that's almost the total, it's equivalent to the total number we had in 2010. Elementary and secondary, uh, you can see that we're going to add almost all of that amount of growth in that particular group. Uh, and here's what happens to the racial and ethnic composition. Again, when you look at 
the populations in these groups, especially when you get not to public education, but when you get to college and universities, look at the growth we expect there from about, if public community colleges are going to about double, universities not quite doubling. And if you look at the percentages in these age groups, we're not going to be there in terms of the percent of Hispanics and African Americans that need to be in colleges and universities in Texas, unless we change some things. And here's what we're going to be spending just if we do what we were doing before. At the level we were doing before, remember it was the per capita that was, was adjusted, for, but we are going to spend more money. You can see how much we're going to spend at each of those levels, but we're going to be spending that because we have lots of kids. There is worse things. We have states, we have countries that are in desperate need of children. Look at some of the long-term statistics for Europe. Europe, who isn't, which isn't diverse, in many countries which does not welcome immigration, at least permanent immigration, and you see what happens if you have only an aging bunch of non-Hispanic whites. Well, what are some of the implications? We've looked at this. We've got a new book coming out called Changing Texas. Implications of addressing or failing or ignoring the Texas challenge. And we call the Texas challenge the challenge of ensuring that all Texans have the skills and education they need to be competitive. And so we said, okay, if the demographic changes occur and everybody makes the same income that they're making now at each educational level, what would happen? Well, what we show is that the average Texas household in 2050 would be $7,700 poorer than the average household in 2010 in constant dollars. It shows as well that the poverty rate would go from 14.5%, which is one of the higher ones in the country, up to 17, almost 18%. But if we were to ensure that minorities or that minorities came to have the same educational levels and hence the same income as other, as, as non-Hispanic whites, that level could be down from 14 to 9.8. If we can reverse these patterns, we go from a negative view to a positive future. For Texas. And let's look at what it could do even for state tax revenues. This is where we'd expect to be by 2050, assuming where we, this is the difference we would have if we close the gaps. So we could add, a, as you can see, uh, 11, 11, 12 billion dollars per year to state tax revenues. Here's a chart that just shows households overall a whole set of different factors, and if we didn't have the demographics we have that go with the socioeconomics we have, if everything was going on a per capita basis, everything, every one of those bars would be right where this line is. You can see what happens to average household income, you can see what happens to net worth, you can see what happens to aggregate net worth, you can see what happens to consumer expenditures. The only thing where we would exceed would be in poverty. We would have more poverty. We'll disproportionately produce poor people. <laughs> Had to show this because I knew that many of you were deeply moved. <laughs> but what am I trying to say when we look forward? Well. I'm trying to say a couple of things, but one of these is this. Whether you look at your region, or you look at Texas, or whether you look at the United States of America as a whole, we basically now have two population groups. One is an aging, literally off the end of the life chart set of non-Hispanic whites. Our fertility has been below replacement for nearly 25 years. Okay? The average non-Hispanic white woman in the United States is 42 years of age, and in Texas, 42 years of age. 
So if we're going to have a bunch more babies, we had better get at it. Okay? <laughs> Or a colleague of mine at Rice, I will not do what he does, and he always says that, by the way, he is willing to help in any way that he can. <laughs> so how else can a population grow? Immigration? Well, non-Hispanic white immigrants are basically European-based, and Europe is the oldest, slowest growing major region of the world and the only major region of the world that the United Nations projects to have fewer people in it in 2050 than it did in 2000. So what you see up here for your area, what you see up here for long-term Texas is likely to be the case. We're going to continue to die out. That doesn't mean we're going to be gone, you know. I don't think they'll have statues up and say this is what non-Hispanic whites used to look at look like, okay? But what is the other population? The other population is minority, it is increasingly Hispanic. Hispanic fertility, although declining, is above, substantially above replacement levels. The average Hispanic woman in Texas and the United States, turns out, is 28 years of age. There's a lot of childbearing years from 28 to 42. And we're still getting immigration as a result of uh, that pop particular population group. So this is what my students affectionately call my X factor slide. Okay? Because what you have here is non-Hispanic whites, okay? This is age, you know, and boy, do we dominate that 90 plus. <laughs> and we do real well at 80, 72 to 89, et cetera, but look at the difference here. And so take this and move it forward in time. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the reality of it is, is that the future of the United States the future of Texas is tied to its minority populations. It's tied to its Hispanics, it's tied to its African American and other populations. And the reality is, is that how well they do is how well the Panhandle will do, it is how well Texas will do, and it is how well the United States of America will do. Well, a lot longer ago when I like to think about it, when I first got involved in this demographic game, I had a fellow graduate student come up to me and he said, you know, I feel sorry for you. And I said, well, except for the physical appearance and the intellect, why do you feel sorry for me? <laughs> and he said, I feel sorry for you because you're part of that population that's going to disappear. And I said, well, that Bothers me on a pretty particular basis, too, okay? But you know, then he smiled at me and he said, you know, and you're also part of that population that can change things going forward for the future of this state and for America. So my ending period of time or ending thought for you is to simply recognize that we are at a crossroads in the Panhandle and in Texas and the U.S. And all of us in here, whatever our racial and ethnic group, whatever our age group, can make this change. And if we succeed, we can make the Panhandle, we can make Texas, we can make the U.S. to be at a competitive advantage going forward uh, into the future of this country and this region of Texas. Thank you. I think everyone understands why we wanted to bring Dr. Murdoch back. Thank you, Steve. That was wonderful uh, information, very uh, informative. And um, I think we have some work to do. So to that end, we, you have on your name tag a, you should have a number, that's the table you will sit at. We will be moving to the exhibit hall. We have a buffet dinner 
or lunch, please get it, sit down, chomp, chow down, and then we'll get busy uh, seeing where we go from here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Steve.